Welcome to the beginning that never happened, the story with no end, and the ending that must always arrive. Like most stories of its kind, our story starts on a speck of dust floating in space, a planet covered in a deep sand desert, in a place with little to no wealth that could be recognized by modern man. But on this speck of dust, there lays a treasure, an ecosystem so unique, so vibrant, yet so fragile in its strength that it can only be found here, out in the desert, in the unending dune. Welcome to Dune, or specifically Dune Spice Wars, this relatively newish 4X strategy game by Shiro Games, based on the masterpiece novels by Frank Herbert, as well as the films, obviously. This game lets you take control of a single faction out of the several who are bidding for power and dominion over Arrakis and its spice, through exploration, expansion, exploitation, and extermination, it is your job to lead your people to a brighter and more prosperous future. Who am I kidding? This is Dune. The events that occur on Arrakis will not just affect your people, but all the people of the known and unknowable universe. Every man, woman, and child, no matter how important or insignificant, everyone who is and will be will feel the ramifications of what happens on this little ball of sand. So, who are we? There are many individual powers at play. You could possibly go with the cunning of the smugglers, or the brutality of the Fremen, the greed of the Harkonnen, or the power of the Emperor. We, of course, chose the honor of House Atreides, or Atreides if you can't. Hold on, I think that I have a uh, clip from the author. Planet, you have the Freeman yeah. forces, you have the... Uh forces of the house of Atreides, do you pronounce it? Atreides. Atreides. It's a thing, don't worry about it. With advantages in working with the inhabitants of Dune, as well as the greater political universe, the Atreides hold power over the sky and in the halls of the great and minor houses alike. What brought us in was a single message. House Atreides was given Arrakis by the Emperor of Mankind. All that they needed to do was take over in the place of their old rivals who had failed the Harkonnen and harvest the spice of the planet, which is so heavily desired and required by so many across the galaxy. We, the Atreides, expected a trap, some act of betrayal, some scummy underhanded play that would cut our honorable house down a peg or two. But here in the story is where this tale becomes a tale of prescience. A single peek into a world that isn't tangible, events that never took place, and destinies thrown to the wind. From the steps of the palace, a single sentence was uttered, an announcement to the world. Paul Atreides is dead. Killed in his quarters by a Harkonnen assassin, before the great scheme of betrayal could even get off the ground, before a single Atreides could set foot out into the dunes. Leto Atreides, the father of Paul, who, once willing to idle in his honor, sit in his throne and wait for the cowards to come, found his normal composure compromised. We knew, however, that acting in blind anger only leads down the road of destruction and despair. So in his personal quarters the night before, Leto made a decision. He gathered his forces and made it known to all in his circles. He would have the head of Vladimir Harkonnen, the dog that took his son, and any who got in his way would come to know why the Harkonnen and the Emperor feared the Atreides so, why they laid so many plans, invested in so many schemes, instead of facing even one of us directly. Working late into the night, being the only ones to know what had occurred, the advisors and their lord met, and they laid plans, not just to maintain their house, but survive the upcoming war. And beyond that, this game you see, it's not one that can be won just by reacting to what your enemy is doing. You can win, or lose, by taking control or losing control of a number of galactic factions through politics or by gripping the spice trade so firmly that, that the other factions simply have to accept your power. Or by killing all that stand in your way and taking the throne for yourself. But armies are expensive, and spies 
take time. So plans must be made as soon as possible and with as much support as possible if you want to take Arrakis for yourself. The advisors cast their suspicions out wide and made a list which would become law for everyone in the room of every faction, every great name that may have played a part in killing the Atreides' bright future. And they cemented their dream of far-reaching, honorable, and righteous vengeance. However, in the words of Duncan Idaho, I know it's it's the name, it's writing, I just, listen, names are fun. Dreams make good stories, but everything important happens while we are awake. So, we went to war. Closing off our borders and gathering in our capital, we realized that we could not huddle in and required more land and allies outside of us. Seeing the Fremen as a possibility, we sent out our troops and started a dual-pronged plan to expand our territory. We moved to secure nearby settlements through force of arm while also using our skilled diplomats to convince settlements on our opposite border to join without a fight. We proved our might as well as our right. Progress was quicker than expected, and we found our call for justice resonating with the people of Dune. Utilizing our still budding intelligence operations, we did what no other faction could, and sent out whispers of our honor to the depths of the great sieges of Dune. One by one, they would ally with us, reducing the raiding parties aimed at our borders while bringing mutual benefits to each of our economies and militaries. But of course, we were not the only ones securing land. We made contact with the Harkonnen first, as their scouts encroached on our newly acquired territory to the north. This was a defining moment in the conflict, as the Harkonnen did as they pleased. They seemed to think that the soft house of Atreides wouldn't even question their place. We made sure all that made it home was a message. Knowing now that the Harkonnen sat at our northern border though was a great boon as it helped us prepare our defenses and know where our enemy lay. Soon after, a small party of Fremen found their way to our eastern border. Emerging like ghosts, they came in the name of Liet Keynes. Liet had decided to not let Arrakis stay ununited and had leveraged their great influence to pull Siege Tabar under her influence. We sent them on their way content in knowing that the Harkonnen would find no open lands nor likely ally to the east. But if we stood in their way, we knew we wouldn't find them either. And finally, we heard a rumor of a great band of smugglers far to the north. Some say the smugglers control very little of what comes and goes on the planet Arrakis as it is so important to the Empire. Some people are stupid, while others say that they have a finger in every pie on the planet, while controlling enough mercenaries to fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with even one of the great houses. Not that people say this for long, mind you, if they're smart. We kept our eyes on the smugglers, however, as despite having little to no control over galactic policies in the public eye, there have been tell of their great talent for making things disappear. Spice, equipment, technology, men, even kings can all be made to disappear. Luckily for us, after scouring the sands, we confirmed that the Emperor would not be making an appearance this day. We had our suspicions involving the Emperor, but all in due time, my friend. With land secure, it was a race. Not one of distance, but one measured in tons of plasteel, stellars, and spice. Each needed to be refined or acquired in great quantities, since despite their differences, spies, soldiers, and politicians all need to be paid and armed. We took land rich in minerals to manufacture plasteel, while also looking for great vents protruding from the sands to bolster our trading and refining of valuables. But before any of this, we built the monstrously large spice harvesters and paired them with ornithopters to watch for worm sign. The last thing we could afford was to lose access to a spice field, much less lose the crew and a harvester along with us. Spice Wars as a game, however, is a game of balance. Our economy was doing fine. As a matter of fact, our resources skyrocketed, and we looked to the border to expand, but our water tanks ran dry. So we had to make space in our settlements for wind catchers to pull moisture out of the air. Then we find our borders wide and rich with resources, but we lack the manpower to defend it. So we build barracks and start recruiting from the local population and build up our own military from the ships arriving. 
But be warned, if your lands take too much of your spice to maintain, then you will find yourself missing payments to the throne and to the guild. Miss those payments, and they will do worse than attack you. They'll lower your stock prices. Basically, for every unit of spice you produce, you are able to sell it on the market for a certain amount of the universe's regular currency. But if they change the exchange rate, it means that you start going down a very, very steep downhill trend of not being able to make enough money off of the spice you are currently producing without expanding. And even if you do pay, then they require more taxes the next time since obviously you made your payments. And the cycle continues. You must find balance and growth in all things. But the Atreides knew this, and with their advantage in taking land peacefully, drawing more and more Fremen to their side by the day, we found ourselves rich, with borders expanding further and further beyond expectations, due to a simple excess in resources and by the overwhelming support of the people. Our cry for justice was returning to us as a roar for vengeance. Now, the Harkonnen would not be an easy foe to vanquish, unless... They were not given the chance to grow into a foe. Knowing the value of each of our own resources, we took a play out of the Harkonnen book, and once they sent a raid to us, we killed them. Then, sent a raid in kind, but far exceeding their own raid in strength. Our goals were clear, stop the spice flowing. Hitting his harvesters, killing his men, and raising his settlements, we tore the Harkonnen economic machine down around his ears, down to the nuts and bolts. We didn't have even close to enough strength to attack their fortress and finish the job, but they didn't have the forces to stop us either. Properly gimping the enemy, we stepped back and decided to play it defensively for a while, see how the Harkonnen and the others would react. We would not leave the Harkonnen alone, but they didn't need to know that, now did they? For all those watching, the Atreides retreated back into their lands and focused on making life on Arrakis easier for its people. Trade deals were made with anyone who would accept, and for the first time in who knows how long, Arrakis was mostly at peace. Then, the knife in the dark. Liet Keynes and her frim. Liet Keynes. Liet Keynes? Liet Keynes? Liet Keynes and her Fremen, fr what the fuck is going on with me? Liet Keynes and her Fremen decided they had had enough, and that our power would not stand in the way of their green Arrakis. At least, that's what we think they decided. They stopped responding to any and all of our communications. They approached from the heading of their siege, and a heavy battle was pitched for control of one of our northern settlements. The Atreides, however, were far too accustomed to a knife in the back. We were ready with a force to counter theirs. Little did they expect that we had an army, hidden by drones designed to hide the footprints of men from the terrifying sandworms. And they had marched in from the deep desert, flanking the enemy. Taking their strategy as our own, we utilized desert power and took a single settlement within walking distance of Siege Tabar. Many battles would take place here as the Fremen emerged from the shadows over every dune, trading casualty for casualty, ambushes for ambushes and atrocities for atrocities. The cry of vengeance, however, was far too loud for us to see the madness we had become a part of. Fresh troops were brought up for every soldier loss. The losses hurt, but they were calculated. We could have possibly sued for peace at this point, taken a chance to wake from our madness even temporarily. The plan, however, could not afford a temporary peace. So as our infantry met on the front line, we shifted our production, leaving the infantry to hold the line without reinforcements, but also without advancing. The fighting was hell, building to building, leaving scars on many of our veterans and taking many of our friends, family, comrades, will never, never be replaced. But as things looked their worst, when we didn't know how many more suns we would get to see rise over this desert wasteland, a rumble came over the dunes. Troop carrier on report. Sit tight in the back. Rockets loaded. Our counterattack 
head started. This time, however, we would not be trying to match the Fremen in the valleys and peaks of Dune, not knife to knife or blood for blood, but firing from above, laying down ordnance like none other, and transporting our fighters safely and quickly where they could do the most work at any given moment. Rolling over the front line with a mighty rage, we rained hell upon our enemies, and when we approached Siege Tabar, fighters were dropped just outside missile range and we marched, supported by the angels above. Barrage after barrage we fought. Masses of fire erupted from deep within the siege, enough to scatter an entire squad in a single salvo of fire. No survivors. The only thing greater than the fire we endured was the hell we unleashed, as the last great subterranean section of the colossal siege collapsed under our combined fire, there was no call for surrender, no terms asked for. Just as silently as they entered this great game, the Fremen of Liet exited the field. The survivors scattered to the dunes. As the guns went quiet, a short-lived cheer went up among the survivors, which did not continue as we counted our dead and we started to realize what we had done. We had fought so hard to get here, to wipe one name off of the list in the great game, but we had killed as a people, not as an individual, as a single massive pseudo-organism, as the Atreides, we had killed another. There was no going back from this, and we all knew it. Fortunately, we had little time to think about the greater ramifications of this. Seeing our distraction, House Harkonnen did what they always do. They plotted and schemed. In the moment we were focused on war, they tried to pass bill after bill, trying to cancel our governorship before it could be ratified by the minor and greater houses. While they also simultaneously tried to tackle our agents wherever they could find them in the field. And once our raids had stopped and we had focused entirely on the Fremen threats, they rebuilt their military to strike out as best they could while we were distracted and weakened. Whatever it took, they they wanted us dead or at least to be a problem. It was honestly pitiful. While we fought and died on the front line, the rest of the House Atreides wasn't doing nothing. The diplomatic cores that we had embedded throughout the galaxy meant our foundation could not be shaken by the untrustworthy Harkonnen. We vetoed their objections with little to no effort, and brought back any man or woman they captured with their weight in spice. No price the Harkonnen gave us was too high. Enraged, the Harkonnen acted as one. They would do whatever it took to gain the power they thirsted for for so long. So, we offered them peace. Peace for everything they could want. Riches of spice and currency, as well as influence and prosperity. We offered them a hand of partnership in the memory of Paul Atreides. We offered them a chance to live. A chance to grow past the horrible stain on human history they had become. And they said no. There was nothing else to say. A single sentence message was passed from person to person, sometimes in handwritten notes, others symbols sewn on clothing, and even at one point by word of mouth. And when it reached the last person, the last loyal Atreides in a line of loyal Atreides, they slit the Harkonnen bastard's throat. We felt dirty lowering ourselves to the level of one who took our future. But on that night, many, many nights ago, Leto had decided that the Harkonnen would get every chance, but that when the old man decided to sacrifice thousands of lives for just a few more days to live, the knife will be ready. A sin for a sin. But there was one more for us to commit. The smugglers had been working behind the scenes this entire time, and were honestly not able to keep up with the Atreides at full roll. We had taken Arrakis at this point, and there was little point for us to do anything about the smugglers. But they had attempted to stop us prior, through sabotaging units fighting the Fremen, which meant more casualties and lost loved ones for us, or exposing our agents to the Harkonnen. But none of this really mattered. Our final goal, the one we had set wide, ended not with the smugglers, but with the Emperor himself. House Corno 
had ignored us so far, and even if we brought the smugglers to bear, they would possibly just call us the winners of the great game for Dune, and leave us to govern our little sandball away from his eyes. We needed to do something, anything we could do, that would force the Emperor himself to come here. So, in the calm of the night, as the winds died down, the smugglers counted their coin and waited for a siege. But instead, a second son was born on the surface of Arrakis. There would be no peace. We declared war on the Emperor. By breaking their ancient laws, they would come. They have no choice. We concentrated our forces and went to meet our enemy. What should have followed was an extended war of attrition as our elite troops skirmished, securing and losing strong points, minimizing casualties, as both the Emperor and ourselves had generally adopted those doctrines long ago. The old Atreides would have fought it like that, waiting for the advantage of air power to arrive at the front and losing many men in the process. Then, as the Emperor's soldiers, his professionally trained, unloaded and mobilized the capital of the Emperor on Dune and spread out across the surrounding area, keeping quiet and expanding steadily, secretly, securely, we the Atreides, in the time we had been on Arrakis, had changed and the Fremen saw it. We secured land almost instantly, calling for volunteers from both Atreides and Fremen nations alike. We utilized the power of Dune and of its people. We slunk across the land, searching and expanding desperately. Tooth and nail we crawled from Dune to Dune. Before they could even start to leave their little valley, we had found our prey. Fremen and Atreides, side by side, stood over the peak. We were indistinguishable from one another, and we emerged from the crests and valleys, swarming over the spice operations and settlement attempts. We killed the scum on sight and gave no quarter. As the shock of what was happening hit the Emperor, it was already too late. The volunteers had come in, first in the hundred and then by the thousand. Equipped with explosives of every variety and arms of every make, the men and women of the Atreides brought the ocean to Dune. In that ocean, we charged forward, bearing our hate, bearing our anger, our outrage and grief. And as one, we drowned the greatest empire known to man in an ocean of blood and hate. Are we the baddies? And there you have it, a bit of a different video, but I have been super excited for Dune Part 2 and haven't actually watched it yet since time of writing, so here we are. In all honesty though, uh, even if you aren't interested in the main story of Dune, I still recommend this game. It's a unique experience, and it's the kind of a balancing plate dance thing you have to do to keep- what the f*** am I trying to say? It's the kind of thing where you are trying to like balance plates and not have any of them fall, and if you do than thousands of people starve to death or are picked off by another faction. It is so much fun bouncing back and forth. So if you like strategy games and you like managing not just a war front, but also like a political front as well as a spy front and everything else, like then it's a good game for you and it's got a great universe built around it and they gave so much love to adapting the universe. So highly recommended. But with that, I will stop gushing. Thank you so much for checking out the video and as always, I will see you wherever our stories may lead.